Hello everyone, my name is James. This is the video number two of the Planetologist. This is the new shooter that I'm been working on. And in this video I'm going to be working on the camp spreadsheets. And the gunslinger. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye bye. mind over mind and I'm going into all the various problems which have to do with the control of the mind and so I might introduce what I'm going to say by saying it from different points of view for example if you're interested in communications it will be the problem of feedback. Or if I may put it in theological terms, how does man follow the will of God if the will of man is perverse? The theologians say, uh, you cannot do this without having divine grace or the power to follow the will of God. How then do you get grace? Why is grace given to some and not to others? If I cannot follow the will of God by my own effort because my will is selfish, how will my will, which is selfish, be transformed into an unselfish will? If I cannot do it because I am already the selfish will, then grace must do it. If grace has not already done it, why not? Because I didn't accept it. But by definition, I had no power to accept it because my will was selfish. Must I then become a Calvinist and say that only those people who are predestined to receive grace will be able to live the good life? Then we come back to the inadmissible position that people who live evil lives and do not get grace because they are not predestined to it out of the infinite wisdom of the Godhead, then God himself must be held responsible for their evil deeds. And so that is a nice little tangle. If I put this in uh, the language of Oriental philosophy and religion, it would be something like this. The Buddha said that wisdom must come only from the abandonment of selfish craving or desire. One who abandons that desire attains nirvana, which is supreme peace, liberation. Nirvana means, in Sanskrit, blow out. That is, exhale the breath. The opposite desire is to breathe in. Now, if you breathe in and hold it, you lose your breath. But if you breathe out, 
it comes back to you. So the principle here is, if you want life, don't cling to it. Let go. But the problem is, if I desire not to desire, is that not already desire? How can I desire not to desire? How can I surrender myself when myself is precisely an urge to hold on, to cling, to cling to life, to continue to survive? I can see rationally that by clinging to myself, I may strangle myself. I may be like a person who has a bad habit as a result of which he is committing suicide. And he knows that, but can't give it up. Because the means of death are so sweet. So it all comes down to this basic question. That human beings have for a long, long time been concerned about transforming their minds. Is there any way in which one's mind can be transformed? Or is it simply a process which is nothing more than a vicious circle? I could ask, why have you come here this afternoon? What were you looking for? Would it be too presumptuous of me to say that you were looking for help? That you hoped you would hear somebody who had something to say that would be of help and relevance to you as members of a world which is running into the most intense difficulty. A world beset by a complex of problems, any one of which would be bad enough. But when you add together all the great political, social and ecological problems with which we are faced, they are appalling. And one naturally says, the reason why we are in such a mess is not simply that we have wrong systems for doing things, whether they be technological, political, or religious, but we have the wrong people. The systems may be all right, but they are in the wrong hands because we are all, in various ways, self-seeking, lacking in wisdom, lacking in courage, afraid of death, afraid of pain, unwilling really to cooperate with others, unwilling to be open to others. And we all think that's too bad. It's me that's wrong. And if only I could be the right person. Is this man going to tell me something that will help me to change myself so that I will be a more creative and cooperative member of the human race. I would like to improve. So in so many people's minds and from so many different angles, there is this urgent feeling that I must improve me. And this is critically important because it's obvious that, at least it's superficially obvious, that the way things are, we are going to hell fast. Now, in this question, can I improve me? There is the obvious difficulty that if I am in need of improvement, the person who's going to do the improving is the one who needs to be improved. And there, immediately, we have a vicious circle. All right, you want grace. Well, ask God, maybe he'll give it to you. And the theologian will tell you, yes, God gives his grace freely. He gives it to all because he loves all. It's here like the air. All you have to do is receive it. Or a more orthodox, a Catholic Christian would say, all you have to do is to be baptized, to take the holy sacrament of the altar, the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, and there is the grace right there. And it's given by these simple physical means so that it's uh, 
very easily and readily available. Well, a lot of people got baptized, and it doesn't always take. People fall from grace. Why do they? You see, we're just talking about the same old problem, but we've put it a step up, but it's the same problem. How can I improve myself? was the first problem. The second problem is, how can I accept grace? They're both the same problem. Because you've got to make a move which will put yourself out of your own control into the control of a better. If you don't believe in the Christian kind of a God, you can believe in the Hindu kind of a God, who is your inner self. You see, you've got a lower self, which you can call your ego. That's that little scoundrelous fellow that's always out for me. But behind the ego, there is the Atman, the inner self, the inward light, as Quakers would call it, the real self, the spirit, which is substantially identical with God. So you've got to meditate in such a way that you identify with your higher self. Now, how do you do that? Well, you start by watching all your thoughts very carefully, watching your feelings, watching your emotions, so that you begin to build up a sense of separation between the watcher and what is watched. So that you are, as it were, no longer carried away by your own stream of consciousness. You remain the witness, impassively, impartially, suspending judgment and watching it all go on. That seems to be something like progress. At least you're taking an objective view of what is going on. You are beginning to be in a position to control it, but just wait a minute. Who is this self behind the self, the watching self? Can you watch that one? It's interesting if you do, because you find out, of course, that this is just as the problem of grace is nothing more than a transposition of the first problem. How am I to be unselfish by my own power? It becomes how am I to get grace by my own power? So in the same way we find that the watching self or the observing self behind all our thoughts and feelings is itself a thought. That is to say when the police enter a house in which there are thieves, the thieves go up from the ground floor to the first floor. When the police arrive on the first floor, the thieves have gone up to the second, and so to the third, and finally out to the roof. And so when the ego is about to be unmasked, it immediately identifies with the higher self. It goes up a level. Because the religious game is simply a refined and highbrow version of the ordinary game. How can I outwit me? How can I one-up me? So, if I find, for example, that in the quest for pleasure, the ordinary pleasures of the world, food, sex, power, possessions, all this becomes a drag, and I think, no, it isn't there, so I go in for the arts, literature, poetry, music, and I absorb myself in, the, in those pleasures, and after a while, they aren't the answer, so I go to psychoanalysis, you see. And uh, then I found out that's not the answer. And I go to religion. But I'm still seeking what I was seeking when I wanted candy bars. I want to get that goodie. Only I see now that, of course, it's not going to be a material goodie. All material goodies fall apart. But maybe there's a spiritual goodie that's not going to fall apart. But in that quest, the quest is not different from the quest for the candy bar. Same old story, 
Only you've refined the candy bar and made it abstract and holy and blessed and so on. So it is with the higher self. The higher self's your old ego. And you sure hope it is eternal. Indestructible and all wise. But then the great problem is how to get that higher self working. How, how does it make any difference to what you do and what you think? I know all kinds of people who've got this higher self going, practicing their yoga. But they're just like ordinary people, sometimes a little worse. And uh, they can fool themselves. They can say, for example, well, my point of view in religion is very liberal. I believe that all religions have uh, divine revelation in them. But I don't understand the way you people fight about it. You fight and say that uh, we, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, have the real religion. Others say, well, we Roman Catholics have it. And the Muslims say, no, it is in the Quran. And this is the right way. And somebody else gets up, and he may be a rather highbrow Catholic, and say, well, God has given the spirit through all the traditions, but ours is the most refined and mature. And then somebody comes along and says, well, as I said, they're all equally revelations of the divine. And in seeing this, of course, I'm much more tolerant than you are. <laughs> you see how that game is going to work? Yeah, I could take this position. Supposing you regard me as some sort of a guru. And you know how gurus hate each other. They're always putting each other down. And I could say, well, I don't put other gurus down. See, that outwits all of them. <laughs> See, we're always doing that. We're always finding a way to be one up. And by the most incredibly subtle means. So you see that, you see? And you say, I realize I'm always doing that. Now tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. If I put it like that. We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You had better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. <laughs> and having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. See, because sometimes doing good to others and to even doing good to oneself is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. 
So we don't know. It's like the problem of geneticists, which they face today. I went to a meeting of geneticists not so long ago where they gathered in a group of philosophers and theologians and said, now look here, we need help. We now are on the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character uh, we would want to have. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want, just tell us. What kind of human beings ought we to breed? So, I said, how will those of us who are genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be? Because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. It may be like, for example, this new kind of high-yield grain which is made and uh, which is becoming ecologically destructive. When we interfere with the processes of nature and breed efficient plants and efficient animals, there's always some way in which we have to pay for it. And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. we could have a plague of virtuous people. Do you realize that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous, does its thing, but in crowds, they're awful. Like a crowd of ants or locusts on the rampage. They're all perfectly good animals, but it's just too much. I could imagine a perfectly pestiferous mass of a million saints. So I said to these people, look, there's the only thing you can do. Just be sure that a vast variety of human beings is maintained. Don't please breed us down to a few excellent types. Excellent for what? We never know how circumstances are going to change. And how our need for different kinds of people changes. At one time, we may need very individualistic and aggressive people. At another time, we may need very cooperative, teamworking people. At another time, we may need people who are full of interest in dexterous manipulation of the external world. At another time, we may need people who explore into their own psychology and are introspective. There is no knowing, but the more varieties and the more skills we have, obviously, the better. So you see, here again, the problem comes out in genetics. We do not really know how to interfere with the way the world is. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex, interrelated organism. The same problem arises in medicine, because the body is a very complexly interrelated organism. And if you look at the body in a superficial way, you may see there's something wrong with it. It's chickenpox. And there's spots that itch and come all out all over the place. Well, you might say, well, spots are there, cut them off. So you kill the bug. Well, then you find you've got real problems. Because you have to introduce some bugs to kill the bug. Like bringing rabbits into Australia. And that starts going all over the place and getting out of hand. But then you think, well, now wait a minute, it wasn't the bugs in the blood, there are bugs all over the place. What was wrong with this person? That his blood system suddenly became vulnerable to those particular bugs. His resistance wasn't up. Therefore, what you should have given him was not an antibiotic, but vitamins. Okay, so we're going to build up his resistance. But resistance to what? And you may build up resistance to this and this and this class of bugs, but then there's another one that loves that situation and comes right in. See, we always look at the human being medically in bits and pieces because we have heart specialists, lung specialists, bone specialists, nerve specialists, and so on. And they each see the human being from their point of view. There are a few generalists 
but they realize the human body is so complicated that no one mind can understand it. And furthermore, supposing we do succeed in healing all these people of their disease, what do we then do about the population problem? I mean, we've stopped cholera, the black bubonic plague, we're getting the better of tuberculosis, we may fix cancer and heart disease. Then what will people die of? Well, then let's go on living. There'll be enormous quantities of us. Then we have to fix this birth thing. Pills for everybody. Then we find what are the effects, the side effects of those pills? What are the psychological effects upon men and women of not breeding uh, uh, children in the usual way? We don't know. And what seems a good thing today, or yesterday, like DDT, turns out tomorrow to have been a disaster. What seemed in the moral and spiritual sphere too, like great virtues in times past, are easily seen today as hideous evils. Let's take, for example, the Inquisition. In its own day, among Catholics, the Holy Inquisition was regarded as we today regard the practice of psychiatry. You, you see, you, you feel that in curing a person of cancer, almost anything is justified. The most complex operations, the most weird surgery, people suspended for days and days on end on the end of tubes with X-ray penetration, burning them. Or people undergoing shock treatment, people locked in the colorless, monotonous corridors of mental institutions. In all good faith, they knew that witchcraft and heresy were terrible things, awful plagues, imperiling people's souls forever and ever. So any means were justified to cure people of heresy. We don't change. We're doing the same thing today, but under different names. We can look back at those people and see how evil that was, but we can't see it in ourselves. So therefore, beware of virtue. Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, said, the highest virtue is not virtue therefore really is virtue. But inferior virtue cannot let go of being virtuous, and therefore is not virtue. Translated uh, in more of a periphrastic way, the highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue, and therefore really is virtue. Lower virtue is so self-conscious that it's not virtue. In other words, when you breathe, you don't congratulate yourself on being virtuous. But breathing is a great virtue. It's a living. When you come out with beautiful eyes, blue or brown or green as the case may be, you don't congratulate yourself for having grown one of the most fabulous jewels on earth. So it's just eyes. And you don't account it a virtue see, to entertain the miracles of color and form, you say, oh, that's just, but that's real virtue, virtue in the sense, the old sense of the word, a strength, is when we talk about the healing virtue of a plant, that's real virtue, but the other virtues are stuck on, they're ersatz, they're imitation virtues. And they usually create trouble. Because more diabolical things are done in the name of righteousness. And be assured that everybody of whatever nationality or political frame of mind or religion always goes to war with a sense of complete rightness. The other side is the devil. Our opponents whether in China or Russia or Vietnam, 
have the same feeling of righteousness about what they're doing as we have on our side. And a plague on both houses. Because, as Confucius said, the goody goodies are the thieves of virtue. Which is the form of our own proverb. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, in a way, the moral, or the immoral, of... <laughs> these considerations is that if you are really aware of your own inner workings you will realize there's nothing you can do to improve yourself because you don't know what better is in any case and you who will do the improving are the one who needs to be improved and this also goes for society. We can change society. We can get enormous enthusiasm going out of the idea that there is a revolution afoot and that this revolution is going to set everything to right. Do you know a revolution that ever set anything to right? Whether the revolution came from the left wing or from the right wing, the best forms of government that have ever existed in the world are those which muddled through where they didn't have any very clear uh, setup of control, but they muddle along. A kind of what I'll call controlled anarchy seems to work out better than anything else. When we have a great system and great power to put it into effect, there is always more violence, more bloodshed, more trouble. It makes no difference whether it be Chairman Mao or Adolf Hitler. So, what instead, therefore, if we see that you can't outwit yourself, you can't be, shall I say, unselfconscious on purpose, you can't be designedly spontaneous, And you cannot be genuinely loving by intending to love. Either you love someone or you don't. If you pretend to love a person, you deceive them and build up reasons for resentment. So you say, well, I ought to be honest. That's, that's the beginning of, oh, so many lies you can't imagine. It's like when... I hear a lot said about love. There's a big love thing on the way. Everybody's got to love everybody. Everybody sings songs about love. Do you know what I do? I buy a gun and bar my door. Because I know there's a storm of hypocrisy brewing. So, let's look at this thing from another point of view, which you will at first think highly depressing. Let's supposing we can't do anything to change ourselves. Suppose we're stuck with it. Now that is the, the worst thing an American audience can hear. There's no way of improving yourself. Because every kind of culture in this country is dedicated to self-improvement. Just take jogging, that deplorable practice. It's a very nice thing to run and to go dancing across the hills uh, at a fast speed. But these joggers are shaking their bones, and rattling their brains, running on their heels. And because there's a grimness about it, it's determinately good for you. See? Why do you go to school? <laughs> no. Now look, look. Now wait a minute. You may not clap when I'm through. <laughs> There's only one reason for going to school, and that is that somebody's got something here, whether it's a professor or a library, that you want to find out. That you are incredibly interested in um, <laughs> how to write Chinese characters or how to understand botany. 
and you would like to know. You're just interested in flowers. And you would like to find out everything there is to be known about them. That's the point of coming here. Or you might like to know how to practice yoga. There are courses now being offered at UCLA on Kundalini Yoga for credit. Pretty funny when I think back 10 years. But the whole point of coming to school is that you're interested in something. You don't come to improve yourself. But the trouble is that the schools got the wrong idea. They gave people honors for learning. And the reward for studying French should be the ability to speak French and enjoy reading French and having fun with French people. But when you get a degree for it, then the degree becomes the point in a game of one-upmanship. And, of course, one-upmanship is the main business of the educational uh, community today. You learn all the rules of how to be a good professor. It's instructive to go to a, prof a professional professor's meeting. In my field, which is philosophy, you go to a congress of philosophers, and you'll find when they all get together in the bar or in the restaurant and somebody's room, the one thing they don't talk about is philosophy. <laughs> it is very bad form indeed to show interest in philosophy among your colleagues. The same is exactly true in clergy gatherings. They don't talk about religion. What they both talk about is politics, church politics and academic politics, because it's bad form to be brilliant on a faculty, because it outclasses your colleagues. Therefore, faculty people tend to cultivate a studied mediocrity. <clears throat> and you've got to watch out for that. I mean, if you get mobs of students coming to your lectures, you get pretty black looks from your colleagues. And then, of course, there's a whole world of one-upmanship in research and publication of learned papers. How many... What's the relative quantity of footnotes to basic text, and footnotes on footnotes, and the various ways of making your bibliography painfully accurate. And, and it's endless. But you see, what it is, it's scholarship about scholarship, and not scholarship. Just as learning, because learning is good for you, is irrelevant to learning. The whole idea of improving yourself by learning is irrelevant to the learning process. And in the same way, doing business is doing business. Doing business, such as uh, manufacturing uh, clothes, is a very good thing to do. I could conceive that it would be extremely enjoyable, something one could be very proud of, to make good clothes. Of course, you need to sell them because you need to eat. But to make clothes to make money raises another question. Because then your interest is not in making clothes, it's in making money, and then you're going to cheat on the clothes. And then you, you get an awful lot of money and you don't know what to do with it. You can't, you know, you can't eat ten roasts of beef in one day. You can't live in six houses at once. You can't drive three Rolls Royces at the same time. What are you to do? Well, you can just go make more money. Just put your money back. Invest it in something else and it'll make more. And you don't give a damn how it's made so long as they make it. You don't care if they foul the rivers, put oil fumes throughout the air everywhere to kill off all the fish. So, not, so long as you see these figures happening. You're not aware of anything else. So, you see, you went out to do a self-improvement thing. Making money, you see, is a measure of improvement. A measure of your economic worthwhileness. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be. It isn't anything of the kind. But you went out, in other words, for the status instead of for the actuality. So if, in other words, you, you do an art, you're a musician, why do you play music? The only re reason for playing music is to enjoy it. If you play music to impress an audience, to be, read about yourself in the newspaper, you're not interested in music. 
So in the same way, why do I come and talk to you? Because I enjoy it. I like the sound of my own voice. I'm interested in what I'm talking about, and I get paid for it. And that's smart in this life, is to get paid for what you enjoy. So here's the situation, you see. There is no, the, the, the whole idea of self-improvement is a, uh, is a will-o'-the-wisp and a hoax. That's not what it's about. Let's begin where we are. What happens if you know, if you know beyond any shadow of doubt that there is nothing you can do to be better? Well, it's kind of a relief, isn't it? Now, you say, well, now what will I do? See, there's a little fidget that comes up. Because we're so used to um, <coughs> making things better, leave the world a better place than when you found it, sort of thing. I want to be of service to other people and all these dreadfully hazy ideas. And uh, so we think, uh, there's that little itch still. But supposing instead of that, seeing that there isn't really anything we can do improve ourselves or to improve the world. If we realize that that is so, it gives us a breather in the course of which we may simply watch what is going on. Watch what happens. Nobody ever does this, you know. And therefore, it sounds terribly simple. It sounds so simple that it's almost, it looks as if it isn't worth doing. Have you ever just watched? Watch what's happening and watch what you are doing by way of reaction to it. Just watch it happen. And don't be in a hurry to think you know what it is. In other words, people look at the, say, oh, that's the external world. Oh, how do you know? The whole thing, from a neurological point of view, is a happening in your head that you think there is something outside the skull is a notion in your nervous system. There may or may not be, but it's a notion in your nervous system. Hmm. You think this is the material world. Well, that's somebody's philosophical idea. Or maybe you're, you think it's spiritual. That too is somebody's philosophical idea. This real world is not spiritual. It is not material. The real world is simply So, could we look at things in that way? Without, as it were, fixing labels and names and gradations and judgments on everything, but watch what happens. Watch what we do. Now, you see, if you do that, you do at least give yourself a chance. And it may be, that when you are in this way freed from busybodiness and being out to improve everything, that your own nature will begin to take care of itself. Because you're not getting in the way of yourself all the time. You will begin to find out that the great things that you do are really happenings. For example, no great genius can explain how he does it. Yes, he said, I have learned a technique to express myself. Because I had something in me that had to come out, I had to know how to give it out. So if I were a musician, I had to learn how music is produced means learning to use an instrument or learning a technique of musical notation or whatever it may be. If I want to describe something, I have to learn a language so that others can understand me. I, I need a technique. But then beyond that, I'm afraid I can't tell you how it was that I used that technique to express this mysterious thing I wanted to show you. If we could tell people that, 
we would have schools where we would infallibly train musical geniuses, scientific uh, miracle minds. And there would be so many of them, we, we, we wouldn't know what to do with them. Geniuses would be a dime a dozen. And then we would say, well, these people are, after all, not very ingenious. You know, PhDs, how many of them are there? Because what is fascinating always about genius is the fellow does something we can't understand. He surprises us. But you see, just in the same way we cannot understand our own brains, neurology knows relatively little about the brain, which is only to say that the brain is a lot smarter than neurology. Yes, yeah, there is this, which can perform all these extraordinary intellectual and cultural miracles. But we don't know how we did it. But we did. We didn't have some campaign to have an improved brain over the monkeys or whatever may be our ancestors. It happened. And all growth, you see, is fundamentally something that happens. But for it to happen, two things are important. And the first is, as I said, you must have the technical ability to express what happens. And secondly, you must get out of your own way. But right at the bottom of the whole problem of control is, how am I to get out of my own way? And if I showed you a system, let's all practice getting out of our own way. It would turn into another form of self-improvement. See, here's the dynamics of this thing. And we find this problem, you see, repeatedly throughout the entire history of human spirituality. In the phraseology of Zen Buddhism, you cannot get this by thinking. You cannot attain to it by not thinking. It is only, you see, as you, as getting out of your own way ceases to be a matter of choice, when you see that there's nothing else for you to do. When you see, in other words, that doing something about your situation is not going to help you. When you see equally that trying not to do anything about it is not going to help you. Where are you? Where do you stand? You're nonplussed. And you are simply reduced to watching. Now you may say, I need some help in this process, and therefore I am going to find someone else to help me. It may be a therapist. It may be a clergyman. It may be a guru. It may be any kind of person who teaches a technique of self-improvement. Now, how will you know whether this person is able to teach you? How can you judge, for example, whether a psychotherapist is a effective or just a charlatan? How can you judge whether a guru is himself spiritually wise or merely a good chatterbox? Well, of course, you ask your friends, you ask uh, his other students or patients, and they're all, of course, enthusiastic. You have to be enthusiastic when you've bought something expensive. If you bought an automobile, which turned out to be a lemon, it's very difficult to admit that it was a lemon and that you were fooled. And it's the same when you buy a religion or an expensive operation. But what people do not sufficiently realize is that when you pick an authority, whether it's a psychotherapeutic one or a religious one, you chose it. In other words, that this fellow or this book or this system is the right one is your opinion. And how are you competent to judge? After all, 
if you are saying to this other person or other source, I think you are the authority, that's your opinion. So you cannot really judge whether an authority is a sound authority unless you yourself are a sound authority. Otherwise, you may just be being fooled. You may say, for example, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right, that's your opinion. I know the Bible says it's the word of God, but it's your opinion that the Bible is not lying. The church says the Bible is the word of God, but it's your opinion that the church is right. You cannot escape from that situation. It's your opinion. So you see, when you select an authority who will help you to improve yourself, it's like hiring the police out of your tax money and putting them in charge of seeing that you obey the law. I mean, can't you take care of yourselves? I mean, is this the land of the free and the home of the brave, or isn't it? But you see, nobody seems to want to be in charge of themselves because they feel they can't do it. As St. Paul said, to will is present with me. But how to do good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. <laughs> so, there at once, we, we are in difficulty. Because trying to improve yourself is like trying to lift yourself up into the air by tugging at your own bootstraps. And it can't be done. Now, there are all sorts of ways in which religious people try to explain that it can be done. I referred already to the grace of God. They say, no, you can't do the job yourself. Because the improving you is the one that needs to be improved. Therefore, you have to say, God, help me. Now, of course, that God exists is your opinion. That God will answer your prayer is your opinion. And your idea of God is your idea of God. If you bought somebody else's script, you bought it. Maybe your mother and father talked to you about God in a very impressive way. But basically, you bought their idea. And if you're a father yourself, I'm a grandfather now, I've got five grandchildren. And I know I'm as stupid as my own grandfather must have been. You know, I am one. I sit there in the position which they look at. Think, oh, wow, he, that's an important man. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I'm just like anyone else. So, I hope my children are not believing things on my authority. Because it's always their authority. If I look impressive and make big noises at them, they've just been taken in. in art and life by describing the fundamental principles of the Taoist philosophy and then of the Zen discipline itself. And we saw that the roots of the idea of spontaneous living make this conception, or rather it isn't so much a conception as a doing, uh, something much more subtle than might ordinarily be imagined. A lot of people think that the spontaneous or completely natural life as it's understood by these Far Eastern philosophers is to act according to whim. There was, for example, a great Zen monk of, uh, that lived shortly after 1000 AD who had a very peculiar way of painting. He had long hair. Soak, he'd get very drunk on uh, rice wine. Then he'd soak his hair in ink and slosh it all over the paper. 
then he would do a Rorschach test on it <laughs> and decide what kind of a landscape it actually was and then put in the finishing touches. And suddenly, out of this apparent mess, a great landscape would be evoked. But the whole art of the thing lay in putting in the finishing touches. And also, there's a very curious thing. If a person who is untrained in painting makes a mess with a brush, it's liable to be just a mess. Whereas if a person who has the feeling of painting in them for a long time, they make a mess with a brush or just do anything, uh, it looks interesting. And that's why if you try uh, to copy the best people in modern, abstract, non-objective painting, you'll find it's a very difficult thing to do. Because there is more to spontaneity than caprice and disorder. And I want to try and explain what that is. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could live absolutely on the spur of the moment? Not make any uh, particular plans, not feel that, uh, well, you might make plans because you could make plans spontaneously, but not to worry about whether you had made the right decision, whether you'll be good or bad, selfish or unselfish, and not to hesitate in anything, you see. In uh, well, one of the great applications of Zen was to the art of fencing. And when you learn fencing, you see you have to learn to be spontaneous. Because here of all places it is true that he who hesitates is lost. If you're engaged in combat, you see, and you stop to think what sort of a defense or attack you ought to make, the enemy's got you. So the way they teach people spontaneity in fencing is very interesting. When you start in to fencing school, you of course live with the teacher. He has a kind of ashram. And, but you're given a janitorial job. You clean up, you wash dishes, you put bedding away and things like that. While you're going about your daily business, the master surprises you with a practice board, which is made of four strips of bamboo, rather loosely tied together. And he hits you with this, surprisingly and suddenly, from nowhere. And you are expected to defend yourself with anything available, with the bedding, with the broom, with the pots and pans, with just anything to defend. But the poor student never knows when the attack is coming, or where it's, what direction it's coming from. And he begins to get tense. And he begins to go around everywhere on a sort of alert. He's watching, watching which direction it's coming from. And as he goes down a certain passage, feeling that the master is probably lurking around that corner, and he's all set to go for him at that, and get that practice board, he suddenly gets hit from behind. So eventually, he gives up. There's absolutely no way of preparing for the attack. And so he just wanders around and sees where the hit is coming. <laughs> and then uh, he's ready to begin fencing. Because if you prepare for an attack from a specific direction, and it comes from some other direction, you have to withdraw from the direction in which you had expected it and send your energy in another direction. And that takes time. So what you do is, you go around with a mind of no expectation. That is called uh, mushin or munen. This is a very important Zen expression. It almost means an empty mind. Uh, you could also call it no heart, because the character shin means both heart and mind, but it isn't quite the same as our word heartless, as we use it. And it isn't the same as the word mindless, state of Mushin is to have a mind like a mirror. And of this, uh, the Taoist sage Zhuangzi said, the perfect man employs his mind as a mirror. It grasps nothing, it refuses nothing, it receives but does not keep. And when uh, anything comes in front of the mirror, it reflects it instantly. The mirror doesn't wait to reflect it. They also say, when the moon rises, 
All bodies of water instantly reflect the moon. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't bother with physics about the speed of light or anything like that. It's irrelevant. <laughs> or they say when you clap your hands, the sound issues immediately. It doesn't stop to consider whether it will issue. And so sparks from the flint, when it's struck, they issue instantly. But to do this, you can't try to be quick. See, if a Zen master corners you with a funny situation, and he puts you in a quandary, expecting spontaneous action from you, don't try to hurry. I've watched Suzuki wait a whole minute before answering. But he doesn't hesitate. <laughs> He's not at all embarrassed by this wait. And he can answer with silence just as well as with a formal response. The point is, do something. When uh, two young Americans wanted to study Zen, they uh, were taken by a Japanese monk to interview the master and act as interpreter. And one of them had had some practice, you know, he knew a bit about it. And so after they'd had tea together and just discussed formalities, the master said in a very easy way, well, what do you gentlemen know about that? And one of these students threw his fan, which he hadn't unfolded, the fan was still folded up, he threw it straight at the master's face. The master slightly moved to one side, and the fan went and went right through the paper wall. And the master laughed like a child. That's the sort of game they get in. Once a master was uh, going around through the forest with a group of students, and he picked up a tree branch. You know, just as one might pick up a tree branch. And suddenly he turned to one of his students and said, what is it? And he hesitated, so he hit him with a branch. And so another student was there, and he turned to him quickly. He said, what is it? He said, give it to me. I want to see it. I'll tell you. So the master tossed the branch to him, and he took it and hit the master. <laughs> Now, you may think all this is kind of rough stuff, but let me give you another story, which is on a rather different level. A certain Zen priest was having dinner at a big party, and the party was being served by a geisha girl who was so elegant and so skillful in serving that he suspected she might have had some Zen training. So he decided to try her out. And he nodded to her, and she immediately came to his plate and sat down in front of his little low table. See, everybody was, would be seated, probably, in front of low tables all around the room, and the geisha servants and people move up and down in the middle. And so she came down and sat down in front of him and bowed, and he said, I would like to give you a present. And she said, I would be most honored. Now, on the table, there, is, there are hibachi, uh, which are little braziers with hot charcoal in them. And you move the charcoal around with iron chopsticks. He took a piece of charcoal out an iron chopstick and offered it to her. She had long, long sleeves on her kimono, and what she did was this. She wound them all around her hands, took the charcoal, immediately got up and went to the kitchen, disposed of the charcoal, changed her robe, which had holes burnt all the, all the way through the sleeves, and came back. And she sat down in front of the master and bowed. And, he said, and she said to him, I would like to give you a present. He said, I would be most honored. <laughs> so she picked up the iron chopstick and handed him the charcoal. And he pulled out a cigarette and said, that's just what I wanted. He said, the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the lesson. The master's spontaneity being ready for that situation was the kind of quick thinking that a good comedian has, who in a completely unprepared way can make all sorts of jokes and turn any situation into a jest of some kind. Uh, there are all sorts of people who do that. Uh, people who are experts in kind of like Dorothy Parker in that sort of repartee. But here it's been developed in a, a very fundamental way and to a very high degree. Now, the way in which it's developed, you see, 
requires a protected situation. Because if we all started to act on the spur of the moment, without the slightest consideration or deliberation, if we all started to act on pure whim, everybody would think we were crazy. And uh, people would avoid us and call the police and things like that. But what they do is this. They start you doing this in the context of a disciplined situation where there are very rigid rules for most of the time. But there are certain instances at which all those rules go hang. And you're in a community which understands the game. Because the point is this, when you start acting spontaneously, you're not used to doing it. And therefore, your responses are unintelligent and inappropriate. But when you become used to doing this, and when it becomes second nature to you to act in the state of motion, of no mind, or no deliberation, then your behavior has matured, and you find that you're accustomed to the response quite appropriately, as the Zen master did in lighting his cigarette from the charcoal. So also in, a, in learning the art of swordsmanship, when he has given up defending himself, preparing his mind for attack, then he's got a mirror mind. This is also likened to a vessel of water, like a wooden barrel. When you make a hole in the barrel, the water instantly flows out of the hole, because the water is always available to come out. It doesn't have to uh, choose. And so you could also say that Mushin is what Krishnamurti calls choicelessness. And uh, because you see, choice in this sense is not quite the same thing as decision. Choice means dithering. You know, there are some people who, before they start to write something down, they, they wiggle their pens a little. Uh, pen dithers over the paper, and then they start to write. And so in the same way, a lot of people in the constantly in the life situation, they dither, because that dithering is anxiety. To be or not to be, that is the question. But there is no question about to be or not to be. See, because to be and not to be go together, as we saw, they arise mutually. So then, in uh, the situation of the Zen community, safeguards are set up within which you can learn how to act without deliberation, which is, you see, in a sense, going back to the state of innocence. Now, it doesn't mean that you give up thinking. It doesn't mean that you become an anti-intellectual. You all can also learn, and this is part of the later phases of Zen training, how to think spontaneously, how to deliberate spontaneously. The saying is, you see, stand or walk as you will, but whatever you do, don't wobble. So this is our difficulty, because human mind uh, has is a feedback system. Feedback has a peculiar susceptibility to nervousness. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the eye that knows me when I know that I know that I know. <laughs> you see? Now, in this way, we think about thinking. We worry about worrying. And then when that really gets bad, you worry because you worry about worrying. Now that is e analogous exactly to the kinds of vibration that are set up in certain mechanical systems. For example, if you, uh, I, d I did this trick on television once. I had the, the cameraman turn the camera on the monitor. The monitor is the television set in the studio where you see what you are doing. And so on this, this show, I said, now I'm going to show you a picture of anxiety. 
don't worry about your sets. There's not going to be anything wrong with your set, so don't turn it off. Now I said, Mr. Cameraman, would you please turn the camera on the monitor? He does that. Now what does he do? He's taking a picture of taking a picture, all in the same system. And as you do that, the system starts going like that. You see, it makes it sets up a kind of oscillation. And you see on the screen all these jagged lines dancing across. Now that's what's meant, you see, by hesitation, attachment, blocking, all that kind of thing which the Zen discipline is designed to overcome. And because the human being is such a peculiarly beautifully organized nervous system and has this tremendously subtle cortex, which is capable of all kinds of thinking about thinking, you see, turn yourself on in the most extraordinary ways by, for example, getting uh, earphones which repeat what you say just a fraction of a second after you say it. In fact, you may delay it. And you can get an oscilloscope tied up with your own heartbeats and get feedback through in this way so that you suddenly begin to see yourself behaving and it completely balls you up because you wait for yourself to go on. But then you realize it's you doing it. But you can't wait on your heartbeat. You can't wait on what you say. And you get this sensation of going faster and faster and faster and faster until you just have to close the whole thing off. So you'll go crazy. So that's what we're doing. And our civilization and our social institutions reflect this in hundreds of ways. And this would be true of any civilization, because all civilization is based on the development of consciousness and feedback. That is to say, the property of self-control, of being self-conscious, looking at what you've done, and then being able to criticize it and correct it. But who criticizes? Is the critic reliable? When you criticize yourself, who will criticize the critic? Or to put it in the other way, quis custodiet, ipsos custodiae. Who will guard the guards themselves? Who will take care of the policemen? Who will govern the president? And that is the big problem. And when we get tied up in that problem, the Chinese got tied up in it because they were simply a very high order of civilization. So did the Japanese. There has to be a break. Somebody has to start throwing things. Otherwise, everybody will go insane. So, Zen functions in that culture as a way of liberation from the tangle of being too civilized. Now, you see, in Japanese culture, people are tremendously concerned with propriety, with good manners, up with the Joneses. One of the funniest things in the world is to watch Japanese people having a bowing contest. <laughs> uh, it's a very frequent thing when friends meet or take leave. They go, ah, and they bow and they bow and they respond and it goes back and forth and see who gets the last one in because I'm more polite than you. <laughs> and the worries about when somebody comes, you know, you visit a family, you always bring a gift. And they start worrying, is this gift suitable? Uh, what, is it anything as good as the gift they last gave us? And uh, is it right for the occasion? Have we thought about it enough? Is there some symbolism in this gift that connects with this person's name or their birthday or something like that? And they think about these things interminably. And thus they cultivate it in the, the ordinary culture. Uh, has a great deal of social nervousness in it. To see girls who giggle and cover their mouths to say, I'm not really giggling. Uh, all sorts of funny things happen because of this immense social awareness and nervousness. Now, Zen breaks that up, only it does it in a way that is as high art as. So you see, in the, just take the, the, the aesthetic domain for the moment. In the whole history of ceramics, the Chinese developed some of the most 
elegant work. You are probably aware, I don't see it at the moment, of the great work of the Sung and Korean potters. Very often done in a jade-like green, a gorgeous uh, texture. Uh, it looks practically as if it was carved out of jade. Well, that led on, you see, to the, to the high techniques of the Ming Dynasty with translucent porcelain, white clay, the most subtle design of all. And that style went also to Japan. And the very, very rich people you read about in, say, books like The Tale of Genji, and you see in a film, and you must see it, Chushingura, uh, the story of the 47 Ronin. The lovely things they had around their houses were unbelievable. The lacquer, the boxes in pure gold, and uh, oh, you know, it was delicious stuff. But then, it was just like having too much eclairs and uh, ice cream. Now what happened? The people who practiced then suddenly got an eye for the beauty of the ordinary. There were two reasons for this. One was that they became fascinated with what happened spontaneously. What pattern a brush would make when handled roughly as a hairline was the show. They also, because they practiced Zazen, sitting quietly, not thinking of anything special, but having a completely open mind. That puts you into a state where you get much better eyes and ears than you ordinarily have. You start really seeing things. Another poem just like it. In the dark forest, a berry drops, the sound of the water. Somebody suddenly realized, you see, just the sound of the water is, is marvelous. That's all. They found that um, they kept getting in very, very cheap Korean rice bowls, the poorest, cheapest kind for peasants to eat out of. And suddenly it struck one of these Zen masters that that was an incomparably beautiful object. Nobody had seen this before. They also had the simplest wooden labels, a uh, bamboo and then a stick in it for use in the kitchen. And one day somebody noticed that this ordinary, everyday kitchen utensil was just lovely. And so in the same way, they found that it was quite as satisfactory to listen to the kettle voice than to listen to an elaborate concert. So what did they do? They started through particularly a man called Senna Rikyu to give parties very small guests, few guests, in shacks, little huts in the garden, made of uh, very primitive materials, such as mud walls, and where they would go and sit, and out of the simplest utensils, carefully chosen by a superb artist, they would simply sit and enjoy the uncomplicated life. And so was born the tea ceremony. Now look at that, you see, in the historical context. That's terribly important. 
it was they going back to the primitive after people were sick of too much civilization. And yet, it was going on to the primitive rather than back. Because the people who selected all those things, they knew the whole tradition of their civilization, their culture. They weren't barbarians. This became the rage. Rikyu became attached to the court. And the shogun had tea with the Rikyu. And everybody started getting digging tea ceremonies. And in due course, the whole thing became awful. 